Uh, let's go ahead and get started. It's 7 o'clock, so I think this is a good time to just kick this thing off. First and foremost, I do want to thank Matrix for uh, putting this thing on. Um, it's you know a, a massive thing for them to host us, to buy us food. Um, so uh, if any of you guys are looking for a very well-respected uh, recruiting uh, firm, uh, Matrix is a great one. So I, I do appreciate them hosting this meetup. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, dynamic JSON powered forms in AngularJS and React. Um, as an introduction, my name is Travis Tidwell. I am the uh, a CTO and co-founder of a, uh, of a startup company here in Dallas uh, called Form.io. I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis over what that company is. Um, and we'll also be talking a lot about uh, Form.io in this presentation just simply because this is what we do. We do dynamic JSON powered forms uh, for your applications. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Software Gnome on Twitter. And then also on GitHub, I do a lot of open source contributions on GitHub. You can find me there. That's a really good, uh, good way to kind of see some of the libraries that we're working with. I, I do a lot with the mean stack. Um, so you're going to find a lot of Node.js, a lot of JavaScript. Pretty much everything we do at Form.io is, is mean uh, based. So it's, uh, we use Express, Node.js, MongoDB, all of the like. And we're never looking back. It's by far the best platform I've ever worked in. It's, it's amazing. So let's just get right to it. JSON powered forms in AngularJS. Another thing I like to do is this entire presentation is actually online right now. Um, so you can go to my, uh, my website, travistidwell.com forward slash presentations forward slash JSON forms. This is really good because I've got a lot of JS fiddles in here. And if you actually want to go open up the JS fiddles, um, that'll allow you to see the source code, see how things are working. And it'll also uh, allow you to, to easily see. So I know that this, the resolution on this screen is not the greatest. Um, so if you want to just take a look at that, I know people are taking pictures of it right now. Go right ahead. No, it's totally fine. It, it's, it's, all, it's all available online. And you're given a presentation. Feel free to fork it and use this on your own presentation if you want to. The format. You don't have to, you don't have to don't talk about exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Although you could if you wanted to. It's a different topic. Yeah, it's completely different. Yeah. <laughs> So let me tell you a little bit about Form.io. So we are a combined form and API platform um, for web developers. And this graphic really explains it. It's kind of hard to see, but um, uh, right here you have an application. This is a web-based application. And there's a little blue box around this form that's inside of this application. This is a dynamic embedded form. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And this is using an AngularJS directive to dynamically render a form and this form is automatically hooked up to an API platform um, that also uses that same schema to generate the API on the back end. You can hook this up to your own services as well as a number of other third party services including Office 365, Dropbox, Mailgun, SendGrid, uh, Gmail, MySQL, Google Sheets. It's pretty interesting. You can use this as a replacement for, uh, for Google Forms if you wanted to. Um, all the like. Another thing that's very important that I want you guys to realize is that um, yes, we are, we are a company, we, are, uh, we have a for pay service. We are also an open source company. All of the renderers, API platform that I'm gonna be talking about today is available to you, open source, very liberally licensed, uh, uh, BSD licensed uh, for you guys to take and use in your own projects if you want to. Of course, we'd like for you to use our services, but um, if, if you wanna take what you learn here, Go and run with it. Use our open source libraries. Uh, we we are more than happy for you to do that. So this is we're an open source company, and we're very much catering to the development community. So what we're going to be talking about is really this constant evolution of web forms. And in order to really capture the state of web forms in today's terms, it, it's very beneficial to kind of stay, take a step backwards. And from the, from the inception of the web and to kind of where we are today, I noticed uh, Peter was talking about uh, uh, you know, uh, WordPress, CMS. There's been some transitions that web forms have, have taken over the years, and we're now kind of in a state, in a phase where there's a lot of churn going on right now on how forms are being dealt with. And it's really important to kind of take that step back, figure out what's going on in the market so that um, we can figure out the best solution. So let's just go way back to web forms, web 1.0. And this is really whenever the web was in, uh, conceived, the form element was, was created in uh, the HTML spec 2, I believe. 
which was 1995. And from that point all the way up until about 2000, uh, there was really this, this static form system. And I know that's really kind of hard to read. This is a JS Fiddle, so if you're looking at this online, Question? Do you think if we dim the lights in here a little bit, we can see the We could probably dim the lights. Let me just do that real quick. Um, <laughs> don't want to do that. <laughs> um, do you know what? Where did it, there we go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, sure. Is that, too, is that too dark? Is that going to throw people off if it's that dark? Like my office. If, if I hear snoring, I'm going to turn the lights back on. <laughs> let's, just, let's just say it's that. It's natural habitat, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, it's very intimate. It's like, I need a glass of wine now. Um, so Webforms 1.0. So this is built with the static HTML web, web pages. Um, it's hard to read, but this is a JS fiddle, so go and take a look at it. Here's the form element. Uh, right next to it, you have this action keyword, and then uh, then this is actually pointing to a backend service. Back whenever web was 1.0, this action was really, it, it was it was almost kind of like the W3C committee just punted and said, you guys figure that out, all we're doing is providing specs for the, the form up front. Inside of here you have a lot of input elements as well as submissions. The result would actually look something like this, although this is way more beautiful than you would have found in web 1.0. Uh, simply because we now have Bootstrap and all the like, and I'm actually using that because if you don't use that, forms just kind of look ugly. So um, this is what it looked like. So this is the static HTML website. There is one major takeaway that I want you guys to take away from this, which is back in Web 1.0, the way that this worked um, is is definitely something to take note of, which is you would have the the uh, the application here, and here you have a form. And whenever you would go to a website, that would actually send a request to the server. Inside that request, you would have uh, what file or what HTML file you were actually requesting. So this was a GET request, and I want to I want to go to the create.html file. The server would then actually look at its file system, find that HTML file, and hand that to the client in, with the form included. It's a very important thing to take away because that's kind of what's changing in, the, in today's terms. That we're trying to address. Uh, we had that one-to-one -one connection based on the request and the file that was actually retrieved. From that point, templating, uh, a lot of people figured out that, hey, you know, from the server's perspective, I can take that request, execute some logic to actually build this thing dynamically and hand that back to the, to, to the client so that they feel like they're requesting an HTML file, but what's really happening from the server's perspective is that's that going in and that's executing some PHP. <coughs> PHP is then going and talking to a MySQL database or whatever database you want to talk to. And from there, it quite literally constructs a form, dynamically builds the page, and then hands that to the client. This really started sparking another evolution of the web. It was actually given a label, Web 2.0. And the reason why this was given a name was because now, the, the web became dynamic. Users could contribute to content of the web. And out of that, really sparked this next generation of web forms. And where web forms were now not this, this static thing that you, that you write inside of HTML, you use back-end logic, back-end PHP, or whatever server language that you want to use to really construct the forms. And I do want to mention that this is still the major majority in today's terms. If you're going to go out and find a job at, out uh, developing for some company, this is what they're doing today. One major takeaway still is even in today's terms, the user is requesting the interface from the server. So the server is responsible for handing the user and saying, this is the interface that you need to use to, to interface with me. That's one really important thing to take away from this discussion because all of that is kind of being flipped on its head right now. And that's really what I want to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about Webforms 2.0, 2000 and today. Out of Web, uh, Webforms 2.0 came this major movement where these frameworks started coming out of the woodworks. You have Symfony, you have uh, Drupal, you have WordPress. I'm kind of anchoring to Drupal right here because that's my background. 
excuse me. That's what I know a lot of. In fact, I, I came from Drupal. And, but Drupal, in my mind, represents everything that's in the market today, what you find. Even in Node.js, uh, uh, sales, uh, you were this, uh, mentioning sales. Sales is even this way. And sales is a very modern framework where these are, these are back-end frameworks that have these mechanisms for dynamically still generating content and handing it to the user as an interface. And in fact, Drupal came out with a, their own schema definitions for forms. And I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with other back-end frameworks, but I, I would be willing to bet a lot of money that every framework on the market has some answer to dynamically building forms on the back end using some object schema. Um, you know, like Symfony, like you're, you're building an array, a, a PHP array, and that PHP array is to represent the form on the front end. Drupal, Drupal has this. And it looks a little bit something like this. PHP kind of makes me like twitch a little bit now, <laughs> even though I wrote this for many, many years. Is that seven code? This is seven. Okay. Because eight's simple. Eight's different. Yes. Yeah, However, simple. eight still has this this paradigm, and the paradigm is is that you're building the form on the back end. The back end is constructing the form, and that form is then handed to the user. And this is this is what everyone deals with today. In fact, there's really nothing telling people otherwise. And you know what? I'd like to say that this actually has worked very well for a really long time. In fact, life was good for a really long time for a developer. You're a developer, you're building Drupal websites, your customers are happy, they've got a website that works, or as a developer I can write, I can write arrays in my PHP code and that, that, those arrays are immediately translated into a form. Life is good. Then this happened. <laughs> so what happened and I really do attribute this to the iPhone, and I don't think I'm the only one that's going to attribute it to the iPhone. The iPhone really kind of rocked the market. And what the iPhone did is it now represented this new interface that was, uh, that was introduced into the market. So now no longer were people looking at their websites on a, on a big screen, you know, they're looking at it on a phone. In fact, I, I know because I was actually experienced this. I, w I was a victim of this and you guys are developers and I, I would actually say all of you guys were a victim as well. You know, we're developers, we don't make much money. However, our bosses make a lot of money and our bosses were the ones that went to the iPhone store to get their new iPhone, the little shiny new iPhone. And the, what's the first thing they're gonna do, right? <laughs> They're gonna go, I wanna check out my fancy website on this new brand new phone. And they immediately look at it like, this looks like crap. This looks like garbage. And, and that's what happened is because now developers were faced with this massive problem because their bosses were unhappy, their customers were unhappy. Suddenly everyone was unhappy with the way things were, right? And it really happened overnight. And it was all attributed to these new interfaces. So this new interface was introduced. And so in a big scramble, developers came out with these, these new ways of building applications. And they, they said to themselves, you know, we need to do things differently. Right now our current, our current way of building apps and building websites is, is not working. We need to build apps differently. In fact, they gave it a label. If you're gonna build a website, build it what? Mobile first. Mobile first. Mobile first. Mobile first. <laughs> they said, we've got we to make these things responsive. And so what ended up happening is, is then, whenever you go to college now and you go and, you go and uh, interview for a job, they're, they're going to they're gonna throw these, they're going to hang their hat that they're mobile first. Everyone's going to hang their hat that they're mobile first. And what actually, is in the, what actually happened here, in my opinion, mobile first did not solve the problem. Mobile first is kind of a band-aid. Um, because there's one thing to really take away from mobile first. And what I want you guys to take away is that the server still provides the interface. It still provides the forms. What's really happening here is that a mobile first website, you're looking at it on a mobile device, that request is still going to the server, the server's still going into the back end, it's still churning, it's still going through the form API to build the form, and then it hands the interface to the phone. It's just that that interface now is flexible. It, it, can, it can flow and it looks good on all devices and everyone is happy. In fact, 
life was good. <laughs> life is good again, right? For the past four years, I don't think any of you guys will disagree, life has been pretty good. We solved that problem, we're good. Then this happened. <laughs> so what's happening right now is that no more our interfaces, the only things that are hitting our servers. No more can we create an interface that has a form and it now is able to achieve all of the data input into my server. In fact, your watch would love to use the same interfaces that you use as a human to input data. It wants to input the data the same way. And in fact, it's trying to. It can't because Drupal just it can't handle it. And there's, there's a major uproar in Drupal right now because of this. But these devices are causing a problem. No more do we have to cater our interfaces to human interaction. I want you guys to put that in your mind. Humans are now, will probably very, very shortly in the future account for one fifth of your traffic. And because humans are slow, we're just slow compared to machines. Your, your Fitbit, your, your Apple Watch is wanting to submit data five times as fast and guess what? It is wanting to use this thing called an API. And because we have built our entire systems, our structure of our servers and the way that forms and the way that data works on this old paradigm that the, the server is responsible for basically creating the interface, we've locked ourselves into a, a system that does not cater to APIs. Um, how many of you have built APIs in your system, but the API logic is completely separate from the form uh, handling logic? It, it happens a lot right now. And the reason why you have to do that is because we are trying to essentially retrofit this API thing in, in, in response to have it also needing uh, form submissions. So we have ourselves a problem happening right now. But there's a solution. And the solution really starts with the forms. And that's what, I, that's what I really would like to argue because forms represent, get this in your minds, forms are the user interface of an API. If you were to, to construct an API and say, I need a user interface for this API, that UI is a form. And I don't think it, many of you will, will argue to that. A form is a way to input data. It's a way to actually get uh, get that data into the system. So let's talk about web forms for the future, which is called uh, web forms 3.0. With this movement, and this act, this movement has actually been labeled web 3.0. A lot of you probably have heard that that tossed around right now. This movement of this 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 shaking of what's happening in the web. In fact, there's a lot of frameworks that are just cropping out of the woodworks because of this. AngularJS is one, and we'll, I will talk a little bit about that, and I'll talk about React as well. These frameworks are coming out of the woodwork because of this, this new Web 3.0 mandate, and the applications now must be made differently. There has to be a total separation between the front end and the back end, where the front end uh, uh, application must only communicate to the, to the back end via APIs. And I know this is a bold statement, but mobile first is no longer good enough. And in fact, we really need to kind of rethink how we're building applications. And what I'd like to propose is that instead of mobile first, we need to start thinking API first. Because API first actually puts you in the mindset that what really matters is that your, your server becomes this API engine and everything on top of it is the app. And it creates this total separation between the application and the backend API server. And I really believe that that's, that's where we need to go and where we need to move. So let's talk a little bit about what API first development means, and I, I will get into JSON powered forms, I promise you. I um, have to get off my soapbox first. Um, so the first thing you need to do is you need to build your REST platform first and your API platform. You're also, your REST platform must be stateless. This means you're not you're not storing cookies and session and using that cookie to establish session. JWT authentication has become a really popular thing these days. It's something we use at Form.io. It provides a very stateless way to, uh, to manage users and scale as well. Your first app should be an API test. And applications must only use those APIs, including forms. This, um, 
So why API first? The answer to this, I believe, is that it forces us to develop websites like web applications, and I would like to, for us to start using those terms separately. Many, for many years, developers would build a website and they're like, yeah, I build web apps. And I think there should be a very distinct difference between a web application and a website. Website is when the server sends the, the website to the, the user's interface. A web application is this thing that exists all on its own. Introducing AngularJS, this is what that framework means. So there are a lot of platforms that are API first. A lot of things you can use today. We have AngularJS, React, Ember, Backbone. I, I wanted to put Jekyll on here because Jekyll, in my opinion, represents something very interesting, which is static site generation. Have any, have any of you guys dealt, uh, done much with static site generation? If we want to have another session over that, I have a lot of experience with that as well. You're basically building a, an entire front-end website that makes you feel like you're using PHP code to do it. But it, it's all, it basically builds a static website. And then, of course, Ionic. Somebody mentioned that they have an interest in Ionic. Ionic is actually Angular themed for the mobile device. So now we have this problem. And the problem is, now that our applications are completely separated from the front end to the back end, we now kind of have to go back to our roots, right? When you're building an app now and you want to build a form, you have to go to the HTML docs. You have to go to Bootstrap and say, how do I, you know, I have to build an HTML form. And I, I'm just going to say it, but the good old fashioned way sucks. Because it's no longer dynamic. You're no longer writing the schema on the back end that that generates a, a form. You now have to actually write this entire form code on the front end to actually get that into your AngularJS application. So now with that said, I'd like to in introduce, or I'm not introducing, this is actually a very well-known concept, which is dynamic form, uh, JSON-powered forms. And this is a major movement that's happening in the web. It's happening in AngularJS. And um, it's, it's very clear that this is the solution for these type of web applications. So it all really means that you're taking this form definition, this form schema, and you are now letting the client do it for you. So with the Drupal API, the form API, what it was doing, it was taking this PHP array, and that PHP array was defining the structure of the form. Now what we're saying is, is the form structure should be a JSON schema. And that JSON schema is used to define the form. You guys are already doing this in your backend applications. What we're saying now is let your backend servers manage data. Don't, don't let it manage the, the form, uh, the, the, the PHP code that defines a form. So this JSON schema is then provided to the application via an API. So the application, instead of requesting a form, it actually just requests schemas. And that JSON schema is handed to a rendering engine, which is a JavaScript library. So this JavaScript renderer takes this schema and then dynamically renders it on the page in real time. And these renderers is what I'm going to be talking about. These we, uh, at Form.io, we've provided two open source renderers so far, and we're working on a third, uh, an AngularJS renderer and a React renderer. And we're working on it just a, a raw jQuery one, so you can get it into other you know uh, legacy applications if you wanted to. But that's what they do. They take this schema and they render them on the page. Here's how it looks. It's not that intimidating. This is a this is a form that has components, and the, the components you'll have a text field, and the text field has a label of first name. There's nothing that frightening about this. And so it, it really does not force you to learn, in my opinion, for, learn something new. You're just, you're just translating what you were, do, were once doing on the server, and now you're doing it on the front end. And it, it's a, a JSON schema for the form. How does the schema compare to Angular Formly? For, it's, it's very similar. Uh, Formly is another mm -hmm. renderer. We, we don't, uh, in fact, we're, we're trying to work with uh, like a consortium of these renderer libraries to create a, a spec, <laughs> okay. a form spec, which I think that's the next step, right? 
The next step is to create a JSON specification that all these renderers adhere to. Have you heard hypermedia and different hypermedia is what you're talking about? Uh, so that's the and there's specs already for that. Okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's this whole concept stems on hypermedia. Hypermedia. The the one reason why we could not use Angular uh, uh, form uh, formally. Uh, that's a great renderer. There were some other layout capabilities that we wanted to achieve with our forms. And uh, uh, at the time, when we were investigating formally, it wasn't able to do that. Okay. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth another, another look. I recommend formally if, if, that, if that meets y'all's needs. Another thing about formally is it's just entirely a front end library. Uh, what we've done with Form.io is tried to say, we want a single schema, one schema, that not only defines the form, but also defines the API. So on the flip side of that, you have something like Swagger, like Swagger IO documentation, which can which defines an API. Unfortunately, Swagger is not flexible enough to define a form. Formally, sch schematics are not flexible enough to define an API. So we kind of had to find this middle ground. And that's what we did with uh, Form.io, was to say, we only want to deal with one schema for both the front end and the back end. So that said is, Hypermedia is that, that whole concept of separating Having some type of metadata that's when, when you receive data, it mm -hmm. gives you information on what actions you can take on on that data. Yep. So it's very similar to what we're doing. I'll I'll, I'll definitely investigate okay. further. Um, how in your schema? How do you define rows and columns? I guess. So those are those would be component types, and so um, and I can actually show you some forms that have rows and columns if you want to look at it. Okay. I think we'll have some time. <laughs> after this presentation to do some deep dive into those type of questions. Okay. And so I, I will because we actually we do provide rows and columns, we do table layouts. All of those are defined by different component types. And the component type, like right here you see this is a text field, we also provide a lot of other types. And these types are actually plugins to the renderer. So you create a plugin which is a component plugin and if you plug that component into the renderer, that renderer now knows how to render your type. In fact, it basically hands off the rendering of that to your component, and your component is actually able to achieve hierarchical renderings as well. So that, that allows you to get really flexible with your components, and I, I can do some deep dives in that if you want to. So let's actually take a look at what this looks like. Here is an actual um, JS fiddle. I know this is, this is uh, the resolution on this, this screen is not good. But what we see here is I'm actually doing a define of the uh, Formio app, which is just a, a div tag. And then right here we have this, this, uh, this AngularJS directive called Formio, Formio. And with the Formio directive, very much like Formly, you can provide a form in JSON schemas, in this JSON schema. And you're basically passing that same um, object that I showed you in the previous slide. That's all this is. It's a very, very same object. And what you get out of that is a dynamically rendered form where the renderer takes that schema and builds out the form for you in real time. You have to be a model object instead of a, the JSON right there in the HTML? Yes, it can. Okay. Yep, you can pass a model object okay. for sure. I'll show you some interesting things with that we're doing with models as well. That's actually later in this, this presentation. You had mentioned you were talking to, are you actually talking with devs on the, the other render, like Angular Formula? Are you so I've, I've uh, had some emails go back and forth between me and the Formula guy. He's very interested in coming together to form a schema, a schema okay. a, a, that we can all agree to. Um, it Right now, the way it, it's going to work is you pick a render that you like best. And you learn the schema. And you learn the schema. The schemas, the schemas for the most part, are fairly consistent. Um, but we, you cannot hand our schema to a formally renderer, and it, and it, it won't know what to do with it. Okay. And vice versa. We, we're, we're not compatible with one. Um, so I, I think you guys get the point. We take this JSON schema, hand it to the directive. The directive then dynamically renders uh, the form. So now I know what you're probably thinking. Okay, this is great, but now I have to build the JSON schema, which is also a pain. So everyone is basically saying that, and, and even formally has this problem. So now you're still dealing with this, this major schema that represents your forms. And there's a lot of forms where it's not very practical. You have massive forms uh, for 
uh, you know, medical records and you have uh, forms for uh, sales opportunities out in the field. These are forms that have a lot of components to them and to be able to try and manage that via a JSON schema is actually not that great, which is really where Form.io comes into play. So what Form.io has done is we've created an open source form builder. This form builder is also open source that allows you to drag and drop components onto a form via a drag and drop interface. And that actually constructs, the form builder's main objective is to create that JSON schema. It builds the components, everything in a, in a, in a visual way. In fact, I can just show this to you really quick. So I've got you know, a to-do application. Let's say I want to just create a, a customer contact form. So I want to just basically say I want to collect first name, I want to collect the last uh, last name. You might want to collect uh, email. If you're writing this JSON schema by hand, you, it would take a while. But this is just easy. We also provide validation, so you can say I want this to be required, unique, min length, max length. Uh, some of these require the back end API to um, a, allow, so required. Uh, you can do on the front end, but unique, you can't. You just cannot do unique because you're doing a lookup against a lot of records. Um, and then let's say like a text area. So right here, I've actually created a form. And if I were to look at the, uh, the, the actual API, which is right here, just open up another tab, this form Oh, you know what? It's, this is on my local host. It would help if I... I was like, why is that not working? That form is actually a JSON object. And that's what the form builder does, is it builds that for you. And that form builder that you just saw, you can get this into your own application to provide form building capabilities into your own application. So there's a lot of apps that you guys might be building where you, you want your customers to build their own forms. You can do that with Formio. You can hand this off to somebody else. You as a developer don't have to worry about forms anymore. You could disc, a business manager could, could easily handle uh, form building and form management in your organization. And you as a developer, you're happy because now you've got a schema that you can work with. And this schema can be loaded into a front-end application, handed immediately to a renderer, and the renderer just automatically renders it. And guess what? As the form is being changed, not only is the API being updated automatically to handle the new schemas, but the front-end automatically updates as well. Because every time the form renders, it's actually going out to the API, this API that you see right here, and loading the new schema. So that's... Essentially what I said here is that whenever you're building a form, with Form.io you're actually doing two things. You're creating that JSON schema for the rendering, but you're also automatically generating a REST API in the back end that works very much like an API. And it has an API input endpoint that allows for get, put, post, delete, as well as index of all records. Now how do you figure out what, what gets indexed? Um, we have a roles and permission system. Um, that allows you to, um, I can get really deep into this, this system if you guys want me to, <clears throat> but essentially you're able to create resources. So for example, a user resource. And uh, you can also create other resources uh, like customer. And each, each record inside of this resource becomes an object that's assigned a role. And you can have a user login form. We also provide OAuth capabilities with all the OAuth providers. Um, can you can you back up a little bit? I can. Okay, so you're talking about the the web forms, the HTML. I, I, I get all that being open source, but the back end API is this open source? The back end is open source as well. Let me let me show you the, the, the URL so you guys can go there. This is a Node.js server. 
that does a couple of things. It creates that platform as well as the form builder. And um, I, can, I can boot this up and show it to you guys what this looks like. The interface, the interface doesn't look like this. The interface actually looks a little bit more archaic, <coughs> but it's like that on purpose with the intent that you can embed that capability into your own application. But it can also be ran completely isolated. You can have a, a Form.io server running on your own servers. Um, it's, uh, it's BSD licensed, so the licensing is very, um, so you guys can take a look at this license. We very much want people to, and companies to adopt this platform. And so we are open sourcing a lot of it. And I'm, uh, we're very transparent in what we're not open sourcing. What we're not open sourcing is the ability to create multiple projects. You know, basically, basically the SaaS portions of it, right? Uh, to where you can have projects and projects have teams and then you have team collaboration. That's not open source, but what is open source is everything you see within a project here. Resources, forms, creating a resource and doing some drag and drop capabilities. All of this that you see here is open source, including the API server behind it. So I see, I see a lot of conferences now that when they want to create a CFP form, they use Google Forms. Yep. Can you use Formio to create something like that? Yes, you can. You can create. Uh, we haven't rolled out. We haven't actually rolled out the Google Forms integration yet. But that all has to do like contact form. You want to hook that up to a spreadsheet. That has to do with actions. Right now, you, the actions basically say, what do you want to do when this form is submitted? I can send out an email. I can trigger a webhook. So if you have your own backend system that you want to trigger a webhook with, you can do that. Uh, you can do a role assignment, Office 365 integration, OAuth support. And in about a week, you'll see Google Sheets here. And Google Sheets will allow you to hook those fields into a Google spreadsheet and that data will automatically populate. But what's different about this versus Google Forms is these forms are embeddable directly within your application. You can take this Form.io directive and now you have this very dynamic generated form within your application that hooks immediately up to a Google spreadsheet, which is something you're not gonna find on the market right now. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So, I'm just as excited about it as you are, guys. <laughs> you put a lot into this. Yeah, we have. And I, uh, myself, but then I also have a team, a team of, of people that have worked on it. And, and we're very proud of it and we're very excited about it. So let's actually take a look at JS Fiddle. <coughs> Travis, we had a question. Yeah, go ahead. You had a, uh, uh, one of your slides showed the SQL uh, SQL query. Yep. How does that, um, the so inside of the settings of like your to-do list, you have a number of things that you can set up. One of those is email settings. You can connect to SynGrid, Mandrill, Mailgun. Um, you can connect to S3 or Dropbox as far as files. Um, I'm gonna get to your question here in a minute. Um, databases allows you to actually put in your host credentials of a database and then execute customized queries based on the form that's coming in. And all of our form submissions that happen, so like within the action, um, so within an action, if I wanted to do a SQL query, I get to decide which handler I want to execute this on. So do I want this, to, this query to occur before the submission is made or after the submission is made? But I also get to do a query on every single method that it gets executed. Uh, create, update, read, delete, or index. I can then decide what, what server I want. This, if, if I had it configured, this would say MySQL or SQL Server and then execute the query. And these queries, so if I said insert into users, um, it's been a while since I've done SQL, <laughs> first name and um, set something. You can actually use twig parameters, it's twig-like. So it's open double squirrely brackets data and then the API key of the submission and that'll inject that into it. It's already we already filter out bad bad behavior um, into that SQL query that'll get executed on the back end. So as these are these are created, you can actually be keeping a SQL database up to date with all of your records from the forms. 
course, this is on the API side, right? This is on. This is executed on the API side. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You wouldn't be able to connect to a database from the client. So. I assume you can execute multiple actions on multiple. Yes, you can. Uh, so let me just. This one, this one will actually probably uh, barf on me if I actually submitted this form now. Uh, but I could actually, let's say you want to send out emails. This is a common one, so I want to send one to myself. Uh, we already provide templates, so templates is pretty cool. You can provide an external template URL using a Git URL. Um, this allows you to use, we use a, a templating language called Nunjux, which is a very twig-like templating language. Um, so that allows you to pull this, this template, populate it with whatever data you want so you can make your emails look really good. And then that sends it out so I can hit submit. Let's say I want to add another email that's titled something. Let's say I want to send an email to the person who filled out the form. I can use twig data email. And now that will actually be sent to the person who filled out the form. So I can send them an email, thank you for registering or thank you for you know, resetting your password. We, we have reset password capabilities as well. So you have full control over what actions are executed, what, what's happened for every single uh, form that's, that's submitted. And using that metadata, uh, you can validate it on the server because like required, you can just send it by unique. So, so validation is interesting. So validation <clears throat> actually occurs on the front end and the back end. And so if I were to say re required here, now this, the front end will check that it's required. So we we'll only even let them submit the form from the front end perspective. But it also protects the back end as well. So we're actually doing double the work for you. Like if you're building an apps in these days and you have an API that you're dealing with, you have to write those validations on the back end and the front end. We're doing both of them for you. Not only that, but you can do execute reg regular expression patterns as well as custom validation. If you know JavaScript, like let's say you want to make sure that whoever enters it enters Bob. You have to be named Bob to enter this field. You could do that with by writing JavaScript in here and <coughs> to do customized validations. And those customized validations occur on both the front end and the back end as well. We use a, a very good construct in Node.js called the sandbox environment where you can, we can execute untrusted JavaScript in the sandbox. Um, so we're protected um, from people trying to you know, write crazy code in this thing. Any other questions? What was that last little box you were showing there on the validation? So, oh, this is secret validation. This is interesting. Whenever we first rolled out Form.io, I, another thing to take note of, this and everything you see here, this entire Form.io platform is built on a project within here called Form.io. So Form.io actually uses Form.io. So this actual website uses it, its own project to build itself. And when we first rolled this out, our user registrations had a beta key access. So you couldn't register unless you had a beta key. And secret validations allows us to write some custom business log custom logic to validate based on beta keys. But we didn't want to send that to the front end because then you could just look at your front end code to see all the available beta keys. So secret validation basically only executes the validation on the back end. It doesn't send it to the client, it's secret. It was very useful for, for, uh, for uh, beta keys. Um, any other questions before I move on? <laughs> I actually do, I will, I will give a little, a very a brief demonstration on how you can very quickly get a, an app up and running on Formio after this presentation. The, uh, when you said the, the crazy code, has it been kid tested yet? Um, I have three kids <laughs> and I have, I've, I've let them bang on keyboards. Actually, I don't let them, they just do it on their own accord. <laughs> and uh, they've actually, they've, they've uncovered some bugs, for sure. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's usually what, the, with the crazy code, it's some <laughs> kid that says, oh, I know how to do it this way yeah. on Windows, but it's on Macintosh. So. You're mentioning you uh, permissions. Exactly, permissions. Um, so the user, I want to know how you handle tokens and you JWT token and permissions. Yep, I, I can get into that. Is that uh, everyone interested in that as well? So let's talk about authentication. That's a really hard thing to accomplish, especially whenever you're dealing with an Angular JS application that you need to authenticate. For my oats, really simple. You create a user resource. When you're creating a resource, you're actually building a form. That's, that's the thing. If you can build a form that represents your object, you've just built a resource. Um, 
So you build a resource. In fact, let me just create a new project. Just to show you how easy it is and fast it is to create a new project. I'm going to build a to-do list application. One click and I'm ready to go. This actually generated all of my resources, all of my forms for me, and it's already in the sandbox, uh, data, uh, sandbox environment. And this preview shows the working application. You can fork this repo on GitHub. And here's what you're asking. How do you deal with user authentication? This is a real working app using this project. Um, how does this work? Everything that you do has a user re has, a, has uh, resources. So if you're doing users, you have a user resource. You don't have to call it users. You can call it customers. You can call it whatever you want. But let me edit this, and let me just add a field to it. So you probably also want, like, let's say, phone number. So I'm going to add a phone number field to my user resource. I'm going to hit save. I've now just created, updated the schema for my resource and now accepts phone number in the API. It really was that easy. Is if you can build a form for it, you can build a resource. Once you've created a resource, <coughs> the next thing that you need to do is you need to think about roles and how do you want to assign roles. What this role assignment action does is it basically says anybody who is inserted into this, this um, resource will be assigned automatically this role. So what this is doing is this is saying with new resources, I want to add authenticated role. So now anybody who is added into this thing, so I can go ahead and add myself. So I just added myself. I now, this record that you see here has. Is that Kindle? It's Kindo Data Grid. So all of our all of our uh, data APIs are Kindo Data Grid compatible. You can just hook it right up to a Data Grid, and you can put that in your own app as well. Um, so all of these records immediately have that. And let's let's talk about where the roles are assigned. So you can actually create new roles for your application by just simply going into the roles section of your settings. So let's say you want to just have something like a sales agent, and sales agents only should have permissions to see these certain records, you could add that here. Once you actually have a resource and you have them assigned a role, you can then decide what they have access to. So for example, I don't want, um, I do not want authenticated users to see my admins. I want to lock that down. So inside my admin resource, I have permissions that allows me to have full granular access on a per resource basis on what roles have access to what. So read all submissions, update all, delete all, create own, read own, update own, delete own. Um, we kind of uh, come from Drupal, so if any of you guys are familiar with Drupal, this is definitely a nod to Drupal's roles and permission system, which is probably the mo one of the more robust roles and permission systems out there. Um, so that's how we modeled it. Uh, now, talking about authentication, now, let's say, now that I've got a user resource, I need to create a form, as you see in this preview, this dynamic form needs to be able to authenticate the user. So if I create a new user here, this is actually a working application. Not only did I create a new record, but I've also authenticated myself. How did that work? Let's actually first take a look at the user table to see that sure enough, I did create a record. It's there. It has an authenticated resource. It has an authenticated uh, 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 role. So now that I'm in here, what should the authenticated people have access to? Well, they should be able to create a new to-do item. Let's take a look at the to-do form. The to-do form has a permission that says authenticated people should be able to create their own. So I can create my own, but I can't create all of them. I can't create to-do items on behalf of other people is what that says. Authentication happens using JWT tokens. Whenever I just submitted this form, I was generated a JWT token that was handed to me that says, here's how you're authenticated. And the JWT token is really my session. Um, I can see that by looking under my resources, local storage, <coughs> and you'll see that this is a Formio token. JWT tokens are very secure. What it really is is a digital signature. I, could, I have the ability to read what's inside of this object, so I could read my username and whatever, but I can't muck with it. I can't change it because it's digitally signed. 
Yeah. So, how about if you if you wanted to, because right now you have a, a, a directive for MyO that takes a URL and it gets the metadata and, and generates that form for you. Yep. Uh, from your app, you say you wanted to, any resource that you create off of that form, say you want to pass something from your application down to that, how do you do that? Okay, I'm going to show you right now. I'll get to that. Okay. So I think I just already showed you how this works. This is dynamic rendering based on the API. So this is the API. This is the result that actually dynamically renders the form. I think you guys get that. Now we're getting into some more complicated stuff. I'm now within an application that's using Form.io. The beauty about Form.io and dynamic, dynamic rendering is I have full control over what happens in that form as well as what data is produced, as well as what do I want to auto-populate. So I can use the APIs that already exist to get records, to get to query, and to auto-populate certain elements within that form, and also hide and show them as I, as I want to. Is there any way you can increase it? Oh, yeah, I could try. There you go. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. yeah. It's about as good as it's going to get. So what I'm doing here is I just want to show you how data binding works. And here I, I've got a controller, and I've got this submission. And the submission has this object. This is what is actually going to be auto-populated as they're filling this out. In Angular, there's this, this thing called a watch, which means I want to watch when this thing changes. And I'm using this library called JSON view to show uh, what, it, what it looks like. So here I have a dynamically rendered form. And I want to show how I have direct access as an application developer what they're actually typing in real time as they're typing it. So that's the read part of what you're asking about. What you're saying is, is I would like to auto-populate based on what's already there. Well, let me just show you what we can do here. I can actually edit this JS fiddle. Update the data. Okay, I, can see I could say name, Travis, run that. And now I have the ability based on the model. So this is AngularJS at its finest, people. This is model-based data filling. I'm, all I have to do is just change a model, and those things auto-populate within that form. And I can also hide. So let's say I wanted to auto-populate a resource relationship. So we have this, thing, this, this concept called nested resources, where you can create relationships of resources. And I want to auto-populate those resources. I can do that using this method. Now, we, we built apps for customers, and we do that all day long. So on your UI builder, you have like some type of hidden field that you can? We have a hidden, yeah, you can, okay. you can actually drag a hidden field. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can actually go to like, um, like a to-do, edit, and we definitely have, here somewhere, hidden. And it, it's got an API key, and you, you can you can give it a, a custom. I don't know why you would give a hidden field a custom class, but you can. I guess the other thing would be how do you handle layouts, and so that you can have columns or. Yeah, you're gonna love this. We actually have layout components. So let's say I want title and status to be right next to each other. I have the ability. This is kind of the reason why we had to kind of build our own schemas, is because it didn't handle layouts. We wanted to be able to say, I want to break this into two columns, drag this over here, drag this right here, and hit save, and now you have them side by side. You can also break columns into other columns. You can create a table. So let's say I wanted to have a table here, and I wanted this to be you know, four, uh, four rows by three, and now I want to have a text field in this one. I'm curious, are you using jQuery drag drop? Or are you using this is this is a it's a library. You can actually look at our source code, but this is a this is a library called um, Angular drag and drop lists okay. that we're leveraging here. So how would you handle like the media query if if you're on a, a smartphone, you want the title and the status to be their own their own row, or their own column? In their own column. Uh, oh, so you're like on top of the other versus side by side. Well, we're, we are using Bootstrap, so this these will scale according to Bootstrap rules okay. automatically for you. So all of, all of the CSS that we're currently using is bootstrap based. We also, uh, uh, you also have full access to the CSS. That's another beauty, and I, I, was, uh, I have a section uh, later in this presentation that talks about the beauty of dynamic embeds. 
versus like an iframe in bed. Like all the other form players out there are doing iframes. And it's just, God, I just hate iframes. <laughs> and the reason why I hate iframes is because you really lose control. You yeah. absolutely lose control. You have no control over the CSS, no control over the JavaScript. You just can't do anything. Here you can. You can add CSS classes, and you can add some rules in your CSS that say, I want this to behave a certain way. So you could drop this into like a foundation? You could. Right now, it's fairly opinionated to, to bootstrap. Yeah. But you could. Each one of these has a custom CSS um, class that you could provide. And so there, I mean, there would be a little bit, you'd have to do it on a per, per element basis, but you can provide your own custom CSS classes. So Angular formally allows you to set, uh, swap out templates. So does this, this way you, you can add the foundation templates, add the bootstrap templates. Yep. How, how does this, this work in every board? So good question. So inside of the, our Formio repo, you're gonna see this thing called form, uh, ng Formio. This is our renderer. And all of these have a uh, components. So here are all the components that we support. We support a ton. Uh, but just to give you an example, uh, like FieldSet. FieldSet currently uh, uses this thing called, a, it uses a provider, a component provider. And a component, component provider not only allows you to register your own components, it allows you to duck punch existing ones. Which is what I think you're asking for. In the, in, in the sense of, I want to use my own template. So here's the template which is Formio Components Field Set, I could change that to something else. Exactly, okay. Here are all the templates. Um, so like, you know, just like panel, as an example. Here's the panel um, component. It's just HTML. You can easily create your own, your own um, uh, component template and just say, I'm gonna use this one instead. And the renderer will happily do that for you. How do you handle conditional form elements so that if based on the model. I'll show you. Um, Randall's one of our senior architects. He's also a um, he's also a JS Fiddle uh, fanboy. So conditional fields. What I love about our platform is we give you control as the developer. Here we have the form IO up here. And down here we have a controller, and what we want to do is we want to hide and show certain fields based on what they select here. All we have to do is watch for the field, and based on that, hide and show certain elements based on what they're actually uh, selecting within the within the form. Okay, so this is not schema based, and this is a custom logic. That we don't we don't have a the the problem with conditionals is those become very opinionated very quickly. I agree. And and what we wanted to do is provide developers the tools to be developers. We want you to be a developer and, and embrace this product and not say <laughs> you have to use our conditional schema generator yeah. to, to do conditionals, because conditionals can be very opinionated. You almost had SurveyMonkey here. I did? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this whole system you built. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I actually feel like it's way more powerful from, from a developer's perspective than SurveyMonkey because you really can have control over what you're doing and have full control over it. And we have a lot of these JS fiddles, and um, if, if we, we're trying to update our help docs to incorporate all of them, uh, but right now our help, if you go to help.formio, um, we, we incorporate a lot of these JS fiddles inside of our uh, documentation. You know, like, uh, does your formio directive expose its controller, kind of like ng form, that you can get access to its controller uh, methods? like? Uh, yeah. Set so what we do is we've actually built a core library. Or is it service? Well, the problem is, the thing is, is, and I haven't even talked about React.js. We have a React.js renderer. Okay. And what we wanted to do is create a core library that both React and the Angular renderers use. And that's called Formio.js. And this is actually, in, a, in an Angular, it's actually a, 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 a service. But this actually gives you full access to all of the backend APIs. Um, there's a number of things here. So like here's the a Formio class or you know, class-based, JavaScript, all of that. So yes, you can. We haven't written much documentation over that, but you can. Great questions. Um, how are we on time? Are you guys okay? Are you guys falling asleep yet? Do I need to turn the lights on? 
Oh, oh, I've got it. I've got it. What's the path for the, uh, the slides, actually? Yeah, it's travistidwell.com. Here, I'll just. Who are your biggest clients using this? So right now, I mean, we're very new. I mean, we've, we've, we've uh, been live for about five months now. <laughs> so we do have customers. We have some paying customers. Right now, the majority of them are, um, are uh, manufacturing service-based customers that uh, one, one customer is using us uh, for their field technicians out in the field. And they, they wanted to basically build an app that is form-based. There's a lot of forms. And they wanted to basically manage those forms and have APIs on the back end. And so that's one customer. The other customer that we're, we're allowed to talk about is Boardman. Boardman out of Oklahoma City is a manu manufacturing company that does manufacturing for very large pressure vessels. And they have a sales force out in the field. And these sales force reps, they wanted them to have ta uh, tablets for them to input sales opportunities. That's uh, one of the projects that I, that I just showed you. So how do they handle offline then? Uh, we have a plugin called Offline Mode, and it basically uh, plugs into the. Uh, it, it essentially hijacks the HTTP directive within Angular JS and makes all of the the directive feel like it's online when it really isn't. And it's using a a cross browser local storage solution to to queue up all the records, and then we have a queue dumping mechanism to where once you go back online, it starts emptying the queues of requests. And when it hits an invalid request, it shows that because it has the schema for the form, yeah. it shows the form and says, hey, there was an error here, fix it. And they hit submit, and then it just continues emptying the queue of submissions. We, we have a very robust offline capability. Uh, it's right here. There you go. TravisTibble.com forward slash presentations forward slash JSON forms. Yep. So if you have the API created, is this a one-to-one -one web form to API, or is the API able to be consumed in different ways? The, so. Yeah, so that's a great question. The, um, from the form and our API perspective, it's one-to-one. -one. However, we have webhook capability. And the beauty about webhooks is it basically triggers off another message to whatever it would be like a, uh, you would have another system um, that's handling the requests. And it could actually have it and define its own interfaces. And, and you basically get this request and then it can basically process the request uh, independently via webhook. Um, so say my Apple Watch yep. was calling in, I, would I have to have a different web form for the you, Apple Watch? You, you would, so the way that you would do an Apple Watch application is you would actually build a form. If your watch was a person and was filling out a form, so let's say it's doing like heartbeat. Imagine your, your watch was a person and filling out a heartbeat five times a second, right? This is the heartbeat, 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 heartbeat. That's an API call, but at its fundamental level, it's a form. So you build that form, and immediately you would have this API that's available to you that you can consume with your, your smartwatch via REST APIs. Every, at, at its most fundamental level, we are an API platform. We're an API platform that has a form component on top of it, which we believe it makes us very different from anybody you're going to find on the market. But my question still is, I have an API, and I'm used to API creating several different web forms that hit it for different scenarios. Does this still support that, or? It, it would create a separate API. And to answer your question, we have one-to-one -one connection between the form and the API that it generates. OK, but I understand yeah. that the way you're thinking, if I use your, your thinking scratch up, it'll build it out one-to-one. But am I able to then go back and modify and pull from your API directly? I can make, I can make any call I want to. Yes. API, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can. We're um, yeah. I mean, we we provide all 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 methods and as well as we're schemaless um, APIs. It's it's like Firebase. You mentioned Firebase. Mm -hmm. We kind of have a similar structure to Firebase, although we're a little bit more structured because. We uh, provide validations based on the forms. Firebase is an event sourcing mechanism. It's not a. It's not. It's real time recipe. Yeah. Is what it is. Yeah. So it, it's a different model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You didn't get into beta binding. You're about to, but uh, have it where you persist your back end. You have a relational database. Uh, right now we have a MongoDB database. Um, that all. It's it's based on MongoDB. Um, however, if you belong, if you're with a company that they say we absolutely cannot have our data go to this other service, we deal with those customers all the time. We use Docker deployments, 
um, as a service where you can deploy our Docker solution into your own environment, hook all of this up to your own database, you own the data, we never touch it, we never see it. MongoDB, for the win. MongoDB is good, I, I'm not gonna say I'm like a Mongo fanboy, but it, it definitely is, is so widespread that the barrier to entry for a company to say I want to spin up a MongoDB is, is pretty low. I saw a question come over here. So. Can you show how the schema looks when you define layout? I want to see a, sure. a JSON schema with layout. Yeah, um, let, me, let me just make this one a little bit simpler than it is. Um, so here I just have title and status, save resource, and so let me actually go and look at this form. I probably need to put this in the beautifier. <clears throat> Give me a second to put that in the beautifier. Or install Chrome extension to beautify. Yeah, I know I should, right? Um, so the components we have uh, columns. So this is a this the type is columns, and because it is of type columns, it knows that it has a columns record, which is an array of uh, two things. So the the renderer knows how to render that, I and like then it. Huh? I like it. Cool. That's how you're solving it. Okay. So it's the recursive nature of your controls. Yeah, the, the, everything's recursive. The yeah. the uh, the columns, all it knows how to do is make columns. It doesn't know anything about the fields underneath it. Okay. But it basically says, I know how to render columns, so I'm going to render columns, I'm going to hand off the, what, what's rendering within me to basically itself. Which other directives, yeah. Other directives. Okay. Yeah, directives, they, they essentially know how to render themselves and they don't know how to render anything else. Okay. Good questions. Um, do we have time to talk about form embedding? Because I can get on my soapbox again about form embedding. Yes. It, sure. Before I do that, does anybody have any other questions okay. so far? I saw you uh, using the form you as a URL in the sort of you know, application where you're invoking. If somebody doesn't want to use the form you and directly want to use the JSON, the output JSON that you're doing. <laughs> I love this question. He's saying, I noticed you're getting your schema from form.io. But that's just a JSON schema. If I just wanted just to install it as a file on my own server, can yeah, I yeah. have the form? If I'm in a corporate network, I don't want to go off. If I just want to just have, maintain my schemas via Git on a, you know, and have, have GitHub have my schemas and render them from GitHub, yes, you can. Our renderer does not care that these forms are coming from form.io. All it cares about is that it's a JSON schema that meets the criteria that knows how to render. So you, yes, you can take that schema, you can put it in a file, and store it in a CDN if you wanted to. And then if that is, that's the okay, case, then it goes back to his question. I'm in my life cycle of my application. I make some changes to the JSON schema. Now that's up to you. Now how do I get back? I mean, am I always supposed to come as a top down to? So, so with, with great flexibility comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, we, uh, I recommend using a, a tool called Gulp. Which, if you guys want another, you guys want another uh, a good session to maybe talk about. Gulp is a good one because I love Gulp. Uh, but Gulp would be able to help you there because Gulp would say, "Hey, I want to Gulp deploy this thing." And when you type Gulp deploy, you would basically take query the J, the new JSON schemas and then push that out to whatever CDNs you wanted, and it would do it from the, via single command line. By the way, talking about CDNs, one very interesting thing to note here is that now we're getting to a time where applications don't need a server to exist. In fact, if you go to form.io, our entire app that you see here is hosted on a CDN. The whole app, there's, it's, it's CDN driven. And so that means that there's no way for this to be handcuffed to a backend system. This is a CDN application that's immediately served to you and only communicates to the form.io servers via API. Interesting little tidbit. Let's talk a little bit about form embedding. There are really two ways to embed a dynamic form, iframe embedding and component embedding. I almost feel like I don't need to go through this section because it sounds like you guys already hate iframes and I don't need to tell no, you why. Go, go ahead and go through it, go, Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would like to talk a little bit about the goods and the bads of iframe embedding. Uh, one thing, 
one thing that you'll, you'll uh, learn it, once you're working with a lot of uh, SaaS providers, especially that do kind of what we do, is they're going to immediately use iframes for putting their systems into your application. In fact, there is, we are right now the only form provider that does not do iframes, uh, that does dynamic based uh, form embedding. And there's a lot of good things about iframes and there's a lot, a lot of bad things. The good thing is that it's really easy to embed. And it usually is just a single line of code and you've got this embedded and it's working. And as a, as a company who's providing my solution to you, iframes is very beneficial in that I, I know that when you embed this iframe in your website, it's going to work. With us, we don't get that benefit. I actually, there could be a lot of things, factors. You could have errors on your page and it would cause it not to work. You also get sandbox functionality. So <clears throat> you could actually have an iframe loaded in your page that is running a different version of Angular than your app is. And if as long as it's in an iframe, it'll happily work. Um, ours will throw up all over you. Um, there's also a negative portion of that, which is you're actually loading two versions of, of Angular every time someone refresh, hits that page. And it makes the, the page time, page load time horrible. The bads is obviously there's no dynamic resizing in iframes. Um, this is actually fairly funny, and I almost, I'm almost hesitant to even show you this library, but I actually wrote a library at my previous company, and that's kind of where 4 my came from, is just some of the heartaches we were having with the previous company I came from. And I wrote this library called Seamless.js, um, which really kind of makes working with seamless iframes much easier uh, to where you can do some really cool stuff um, like inject an image and the, the iframe immediately resizes uh, to fit the content. So you can solve some of these problems with the library, but it's, it's, it, that's, there's, there's a lot of handshaking that's involved between the parent and the client, it's, 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 a, it's a nightmare. You also cannot modify the CSS. You, you just have no control over what's inside of that. If, if you know, we're using Bootstrap and if you don't like Bootstrap, you, there's nothing you can do about it. You asked a question about <clears throat> about foundation, the love foundation. You, you, we would basically be loading a bootstrap form in, into a foundation website, which uh, may not look good. Hmm. Actually, foundation, it's interesting. You probably noticed that um, our website kind of has hard <coughs> edges like foundation. Yes. The, like the, the sharp edges, which we like a lot. We're actually using a foundation theme for bootstrap. <laughs> <laughs> called Yeti. If you ever, if you look at Bootswatch, there's a Yeti theme that, and it's, it's it, it, because their their symbol is a Yeti. Yeti is actually a, a theme in Bootstrap to make it look like foundation. So. And I'm not going to answer your, the next question you're going to ask, which is why aren't we using right. foundation? <laughs> um, there's some certain reasons, mainly because uh, Bootstrap is so widespread, and we wanted to use something that was uh, had the majority market. <coughs> Uh, also, you cannot control JavaScript inside of an iframe. <clears throat> also, this is a massive pain. Some browsers just flat out say, just decide not to do iframes. Like Safari hates iframes and will completely block a lot of things like cookies. You can't use cookies in an iframe in Safari. I don't know if you know that, but it just, it just things just don't work. Safari wasn't loading JS Fiddle. Oh, it wasn't? No. Yeah, that's probably why. Uh, nested navigation. Um, this is this gets almost comical when you're on an iframe, and let's say there's a link on your form that says, you know, uh, go here to read more information, and it's a link to another website. If you click that link in an iframe, it actually navigates to that page within the iframe, and now you are basically uh, created inception, and you don't know how to get back. <laughs> And it also loads slow. And the reason why it loads slow is because you're loading libraries twice. If you if you have jQuery on your parent page and there's jQuery on the on the child page, you're going to load jQuery two times. <clears throat> I mean, it's double the loading time. And also, this everyone knows this cross origin nightmares. Um, browsers just do not like iframes. Uh, then there's this thing called component embedding, which is what we use, which is the, the Angular JS directives, uh, the React directives as well. You missed one, one of the, uh, good one, uh, is uh, 
But if you put a plugin inside an iframe, it can't hijack your your main sites in terms of uh, so the security sandbox. Of Sandboxing. It, I mean, I, I, okay, yeah. you just the security sandboxing was the important piece. Yep. That, that's that's kind of what I wanted to okay. encapsulate with sandboxing, which is actually is really I important. And by loading your J JS file in, in your in the main app, yep. they now you have access to everything. So what's what's great about what well, we're doing at for my own, we're actually uh, very reluctantly going to come out with an iframe solution, but it's actually going to just end up loading a, a page that's iframe ready that uses ang uh, Angular rendering within the iframe. So we, we will achieve iframe eventually. We just we haven't had enough push to get it in, in sure. place just because people are very happy with with the way our, our philosophy on it. But you're right, sandboxing is, is a big, big deal for iframes. Uh, component embedding, the goods and the bad. So the goods for component embedding obviously is this direct DOM injection. And what you get out of that is dynamic resizing as the form elements populate the inside the DOM, the DOM adjusts. It's not dealing with an iframe. It just things you know fall into place around the the form. Things just work. You have full CSS control, full JavaScript control, much faster loading, direct API access from the application, which also is a big deal. Um, you know, you you what I was showing you earlier, where you you want to actually hit RESTful API requests, and then from those REST APIs, auto populate items in the in the form. You just cannot do that in iframes. The bads is it's hard to embed, and, that, and that's one of my the biggest drawbacks to using Formio is um, it, unless you know, unless you're basically uh, spinning it up and under you know uh, determined dependencies. Like right now, we're Angular 1.4. If you had an Angular 2.0 app and you try to use Formio, it wouldn't work. Um, that's why we're going to come out with an iframe embedding. But also, we're coming out with different renderers for that reason as well. Well, I'm wondering with your current com component embedding, I mean, you can. Geo JSON tokens from a, a major app, you know. So, with yes, but the renderer is a completely open source. Yeah. You're not loading anything into your application that isn't a complete BSD licensed open source product. Uh, it's a it's a renderer. Yeah. All you're really putting into your app is a renderer, and that renderer is available open source. So you you'll you can see the source code. We're not I agree. You're not doing nothing malicious, yeah. but it's it just in theory. Yeah, and that's that's what could happen. Yeah, um, it also requires this dependency alignment that I was just kind of referring to. You kind of have to be aligned with the dependencies in order for things just to kind of jive the way they're supposed to. Um, so here's actually how component embedding works within Formio, and this is for Angular JS. You uh, you can create at the very top of your file. You can use Formio dash full. Um, if you already have Angular in, uh, added to your page, uh, drop the full, and that'll only add the full Mayo uh, pieces. Um, but in order for that to work, you have to make sure you have your AngularJS already in the app. Um, and then from there, you can just uh, declare the full Mayo, and then from that, the full Mayo comes alive, and you can point that to one of your forms that you've created, and it dynamically renders. I mean, it's 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 about as simple as we could possibly make it. Um, we try. We were trying really hard to make it even easier, but it's, it's just yeah. Quick question: The CSS does that come with you know whatever is inside the directive, or do you have to define the CSS outside of it? Um, I actually did. A good question. I actually didn't include the CSS for some reason, but Formio actually also has a CSS portion to it, uh, which is just the form. Um, additives on top of Bootstrap. So right now, if you just included Bootstrap and included Formio.js, your forms would look great. So if you just have Bootstrap and then this, you're you're good. How do you deal with uh, like CSS resets? So the outside website has some weird class of words for the Bootstrap stuff. Yeah, no, we don't. I mean, it's uh, that's you know that's that's component embedding for you. It's you know. I think every everybody who comes out with an Angular directive has that problem, and I don't, I don't know if there's a way to solve that. Yep. Does uh, <coughs> Formio have its own widgets, or do you use uh, components of uh, of JS library? Good question. We we leverage uh, highly uh, supported uh, components, like our datetime component is uh, pulls from the Angular datetime component. Uh, we use UI Bootstrap for uh, some of our uh, components. What about, what about what trees, um, 
three grids, grids. The, those are actually surprisingly easy because um, th that's just bootstrap tables and bootstrap uh, columns, grids. And so we're actually able to achieve that pretty easily using uh, leveraging bootstrap without using any outside libraries. Um, I was going to say, oh, some of, some things we use are, uh, are are like JavaScript libraries. Like for example, if you wanted to add a something I even did, didn't even do, like like the signature component, if you wanted to collect e signatures, this signature component is actually a JavaScript library that does Canvas signatures. That's awesome. Yeah, and and it actually what I love about this signature component is it stores it as <coughs> binary. It's not you're not saving an image here. You're saving the, the um, base64 binary of the canvas signature. So when you render it, you actually plug that into the source of an image and it just renders it like an image. Even though it's not an image, it's actually base64. But that's what we're saving. So. Can you demonstrate a grid or a tree right, uh, visually right now? A grid? A I've grid? got uh, or a tree. my, um, our lead architect has a, has a grid for you. Um, and uh, the question I have about that is things like drag drop, things like that. Um, so his custom component, this, this allows, this also shows you how you can do custom components. Custom components is pretty powerful. You can actually register your own components. Um, so like right here he created one called matrix. It's called a check matrix component. And this allows you to dynamically change uh, like six columns and seven rows. And now we have check me, check me, check me. And, and when you check this, it'll actually, when you submit it, I think it even shows you how, it's, how it looks inside of, oh no he doesn't, how the data looks. But this is actually saved as like a data grid. And it's achieved via a custom component, which if we do, if we do not supply the, the component you need, you can build your own and have that as part of your, your repo and plug that in and then you have your own custom components that you need within your form. So there, there's, that's, that's a data grid. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so React is, I, I'm not a React guy. I, I love React, but um, I didn't implement our React render, but I wanted to show this to let you guys know that React, we do have React.js support, so we have a renderer that'll render our forms in React if you guys use React. This is actually a JSON powered form within my reveal JS presentation. So this actually shows you a real live rendering. In fact, I can refresh this page and um, I may have made a mistake, there it goes. So this actually just rendered um, and you guys can go fill out this form. And not only will you get an email, so I've got some actions tied to the back end where I'll send you an email, say hey, thank you for filling this out. But we get an email and this also goes into the back end so I can hit submit there. Submission was created. We basically have full functioning dynamic <coughs> JSON powered forms within a presentation. This is Reveal JS presentation. And you can tell by looking at it, this is not an iframe. And this also shows you that you have full control of the CSS because this form looks horrible. <laughs> and, it, and it wouldn't look horrible if I, would, if, if I had control over the CSS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it, everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. <laughs> so I, I, I will, I would like to open this up for other. Um, let me just save this real quick because I'm going to put this on. Um, I'm going to put this on YouTube so you guys can watch this at a later time. Um, um, other questions? Do you mind grabbing the, the light? That's good. All right. Just open it up to other questions. Can you talk a little bit about like how if you have like a very long series of forms how you can save along the way? Um, wizard. Yes. Somebody asked about wizards. Um, you go to formio.github, formio wizard. This this also shows illustrates um, if it, if it works. There it goes. Um, this also illustrates how you can take a single form and write a plugin library that turns that single form into a wizard. In fact, this, this wizard is actually built from, let's 
so I can find it. So this form right here, I use panels on the root, okay. and all the panels on the root represent what would be different forms within the wizard. And um, I wrote a, a custom uh, directive that works just like Form.io, but instead of saying Form.io, you say Form.io-wizard, and it turns that form into a wizard that also does inline validation, so I can't move on to the next step. until I actually fill this out. And then once I actually submit this thing, it actually submits as one single submission. So has the last page been saved? Or did you yeah, it actually does. It saves as you move forward mm -hmm. in local local storage. But does it save to the back? No, okay. no. Um, you can also do forms. Um, so just so you know, this is also open source. If you guys want to go to Formio, Formio Wizard. This also should hopefully illustrate how flexible this, this system is that we have I just built a, a plugin that listens for the, um, that basically renders um, each panel dynamically. And here you can see, um, here's when it actually saves the submission. Here's me saving the submission. So using the API to save the submission. Um, here's where I'm checking the error so I can actually iterate through um, the form, look at its uh, children and just make C and just set the pristine to false, which will actually automatically validate uh, because it's no longer pristine. Um, and then here I'm actually embedding a, that Formio directive, so I'm creating it, and I'm, I'm um, basically setting the, uh, the, the next form object to be that panel. So whenever you look at these panels here, it's basically using these panels to step through the wizard. But even from a UI perspective, this is nice. I mean, this is to set up a wizard in this, this way is, is very nice. Um, so you actually end up with a very robust way to actually build wizards that aren't constantly hitting your servers either. It's not gonna hit your server until they're done with the wizard. I'm surprised you did it that way and didn't use a custom type in your system. You, you could, so you could actually do it with a custom type. Yeah. You can take all of that code that I did within this directive. I kind of needed something to wrap the Form.io directive though. I kind of needed something on me on the outside of it to get what I wanted. But you know what? Uh, submit a pull request and I will, <laughs> I will look at it. Go ahead. They're uh, looking at the code. They're going to go um, using dollar sign scope. And there's a lot of movement to using controller as instead of. Yeah, controller as is an Angular 1.4 thing. Um, and uh, I, I'm not well adjusted yet. <laughs> so I was wondering if it was an intentional reason or just you haven't quite caught up with that. I mean, I've, we, we, we actually are Angular 1.4 compatible, so you you, lo lo you can load us into 1.4 app just fine. Um, from, from us as a development team, we haven't yet adjusted to that yet. A lot of things will be simplified in controller Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. So that way you can use this pointer, right? Yeah. yeah. Instead of using um, the, the scope. It also helps when you look at the markup. And you're, you can figure out what. Yeah. This what is controller is being what the model and all that. Kind of stuff. I'll say it again, guys. This is open source. Feel free to have at it. <laughs> I will accept a pull request if you guys want to contribute to this project. Good. Uh, so yeah. how many people are working on this project? I'm curious. Um, so I mean, that's all available on GitHub as well. So we have uh, right now. There's um, uh, one of them is a robot. <laughs> this is our uh, the actual developers that we have at this point is uh, six developers. And uh, I'm curious, how many of those are, oh, well, I don't know, is, is this your company? Or is this your, uh, I'm a co-founder CTO. Co-founder. Co and okay. this was actually my idea, so. Okay, how many co-founders are in that list? Uh, we have two other co-founders and they're not developers. They're not developers, okay. Yeah, one uh, other co-founder, uh, Gary Wetzel, he's a CEO, um, was, a, was a Travelocity CFO for a number of years, very renowned CEO. And then Denise Kay is our, uh, Chief Business Development Officer. So, okay. new company. We uh, we're uh, we've bootstrapped with friends and family money at this point. Um, so I don't know if you guys have connections to invest investors, but we are we are looking for investment channels at this time, as well. Any other questions? 
It's good. Thank you guys. I appreciate it.